the standard of living in the divine nature. We talked about the components of ourself. Now it's time to embody it all. Second Peter 1 verses 3 through 8. Second Peter verse 1. Sorry, chapter 1 verses 3 through 8. The first part, we're going to do this work together. And then we're going to let it wash over us. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're hearing. Put your mind and your heart on this. The word of God reads, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Everything you need, he's given to you already. Already. We say we know this, right? It's right here. It's in our mind, right? What about our hearts? How do our hearts reflect that everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness, you've already been given it. It is here that we see that we have the liberty to live free from the power of death and sin. Through the finished work of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we have the liberty to live free from death and sin. Through the finished work, completed, done, of Jesus Christ and the empowerment, the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. The scripture says we have been granted all things pertaining to life and godliness. So then why do we live focused on death and sin? Our hearts grieved because of the death of a loved one, because of a death of a situation, because of the ending of a thing, grieved, our minds perplexed because of sin, trying to wrestle with why. Many of us have come to the faith based off of death and sin. Somebody asked you, if you die today, where are you going to end up in eternity? Some of, our, some, some of us had that question asked. We've been to revivals. We've been to, to services and conferences. And the mounting of our faith has been on death. Be saved from your sin. And so if you're coming into the faith, my lenses are set to what I need to do before I die, how I'm living before I die, and the sin that has me wrapped up. So then I don't count myself worthy because my focus is on sin and on death. I'm overridden with grief every, something, every time something bad happens because I'm tangled up and my focus is always on death. We live for the end. Your day-to-day life, I can't wait till this day is over. I can't wait till I clock out. I can't wait till they get grown and get on their own. We live for the end of a thing. Our minds are set and limited to death. And because of our own inabilities, we think, it's easier for for us to see and criticize others. Our, Our eyes are set towards sin. And it's probably because of the introduction that you had to your faith. 
See, this letter, this, this writing was given to a people who were experiencing persecution. Peter wanted to get some words out to the church before he died because he knew his end was coming. But he had a charge and a mandate given to him from Christ. He said, when you have been converted, I need you to go strengthen your brother. So he went about preaching and teaching. He said, before I actually finish my work on this side, I need to make sure you understand that the gospel that came, the word that was lived out before us was so that we know that we have life and godliness. Everything that we need, we have. Because that was a wash for many people. I want to live so I can die. Because of what they were experiencing in the church at that time, death was a reward. And so many people got out of the mindset of what do I do now? What do I do here? They just started clamoring for death. We did it too. Look at our ancestry. The songs that we sang. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for it to carry me home. Our minds were set on the glorious death because of the persecution, because of the hardship of life. And because we're not bound in chains, we think we're free from that oppression when we're not. Because so many of us in here right now are clamoring for death. I wish it would all be over. This hurts too much. Hurry up, let's get to the other side of this. Without learning how to live. We're talking about the standard of living, but our eyes have been set to death and sin. How can you truly live free if you're always beating yourself up over the head with the sin that you commit? You are toppled over with the mistakes that you make day to day. And you limit yourself. We limit ourselves to the grace that God has granted to us to live empowered beyond the sin. Watch this. The finished work of Christ is complete. Everything that you have done, everything that you will ever do has been covered by his blood. We say we know this. We say we know this here, right? It's in our mind. But when we get to the heart of the matter, when we start dealing with our heart, do we really believe that we have been forgiven? Do we really believe in the love that comes and envelops and suffocates sin? Do we really believe that God will love us so much that no matter what we have done, God is sitting waiting and say, hey, come on. Remember who you are. We are image bearers of the Lord. Take us back to creation. See, most of us, we get caught with the sin nature, right? David, the psalmist said it. You know, I was born in sin and I was shaped in iniquity. Your lenses are set on sin. But go all the way back to the beginning. When God said, let us make man humankind in our image your nature your divine nature is to reflect God your divine nature you're not some sin sick soul and so Peter he said, listen, y'all get this message out to the church. I need you to know that everything you need for life and for godliness that you think you can't acquire, you can't obtain because of whatever is going on in you, you already have it. Sit with that. If I believed that I truly bear the image of the almighty God, how would my days be different? If we truly believed that everything that we need for life, not our ambition. See, that's where you got to check your heart and your mind. Not our ambition, not our goals for our lives. But when we start following after Christ, we will see that everything that we need for this life 
everything we need for godliness, the reverence of God with our lives. Godliness, meaning that God is pleased with the way we live. He's not looking for you to be perfect. Pleasing. Because as you grow in the matter to live before God in the way that is pleasing, he will perfect you. Because his word won't return, boy, be ye holy, for I am holy. We, the great promises. Peter said, listen, I need y'all to know that you have this. Because you're living beneath this. And there's so many other people that are being lost because you won't live. And see, four, we started asking ourselves questions like, like, what would it be if I really contributed all that I have everywhere that I am? See, I do the God stuff with God's folks. I do the God stuff at God's house. But what if that spread? What if you stop segregating and segmenting your life to where the skills and the talents I have, I capitalize on it here, but then I don't bring them here to God's house. Like, what if we just had one life? Because I work as unto the Lord. Right? So it shouldn't matter where I am. If I begin to live before God in the way that is pleasing to him, that has no limits, that has no walls, that has no barriers. Everywhere that I am, I live before God. That's godliness, reverence of God. How do our actions reverence God? How do our conversations reverence God? And it's not that we can't. Everything we need for life and godliness, we have. But it's because we distance ourselves from God. To say, God is only here when I sing and invoke his presence. When I say, Lord, show up. Now I want you to be here. I invite you in, so you're here. So now tell us what to do. God is present always. You make the decision whether or not you live before him. We make that decision. But everything that you will ever need, you say, this is hard. I can't really give it up. You can. How? How? If the divine nature is me living in the power of the Holy Spirit, reflecting God's glory, being an imitator of Christ's life, how do I begin to do that? We learn. We learn. We live. We learn. We live. How do I live in the divine nature? We talking about the standard of living? You learn. You live what you just learned. And as you're living that out, you'll learn some more. And as you're learning that, that couples with this, you'll learn some more. The text says that for, every, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Watch this. And your virtue with knowledge. Keep going. And your knowledge with self-control. Keep going. And your self-control with steadfastness. Keep going. And your steadfastness with godliness. Keep going. And your godliness with brotherly affection. Keep going some more. And your brotherly affection with love. We keep going. See, when we're so focused on death, we don't see the adventure of life. We get so mad at ourselves for not conquering, for not accomplishing, that we just stop and say, well, just, you know, I'll let life pass because I didn't do it right. No, everything you get, you learn, you live, you learn, you live, you learn, you live. We find ourselves stagnant, bored, because we think we've done it all. You ever been around people to say, I know that. I've been there, I've done that, got the t-shirt. Go again. You missed something. There was a souvenir that you forgot to pick up. You didn't have the money for that souvenir then, so I need you to go back. 
You got the tooth, you got the t-shirt, but I need you to go get the cap. I, you got the cap now, but I need you to go back and get the water bottle. Y'all ever been to an amusement park? And you be like, dang, I really wish I had that. I bought that funnel cake. Okay, now I can only get this. But now, watch this, as I learn, as I couple my faith with virtue, I got a little more equity. I got a little more to spend with life. So before when I just had this t-shirt, you're like, oh, you've been there, you did, okay. Now I get to go back. I get to ride another ride. Whew, I know now, don't wear this wig on that ride. You gotta use a ponytail for this one. All right, I got the lesson. Check the box. But the next time I go, because I've been working, I've been living, I got a little more to give to life. I got a little more to experience with life. Stop making life the death of you. Come on. We live so oppressed by death and by sin. But when I set my mind that, you know what, I just learned a new lesson. Let me, let me see how that works for me. All right, maybe I should, okay, I go back, I'll pray. Okay, I'm going to sit down. Okay, wait, what happened? We're going to call. Okay, wait, what happened? Serve dinner at this time. Okay, well, that schedule isn't really working for me. I need to do a 6 o'clock dinner because this one, we get in the bed too late. You have to learn and live and learn and live. How do I? begin to live into the divine nature. I have to be a continuous student of Jesus Christ. Simple terms, discipleship. In this life, we set high goals. We have great ambitions. And most successful people will tell you, you need to have great books around you, right? Anybody here heard that before? You know, you need to have some books about history. You want to learn about your craft. But I, then I need you to go get a biography. Study the life of people who've made it, right? Have you all ever heard that? You want to be something? You want to go somewhere? You want to study the people who have been there. We have to study the life of Christ. Because that's where we get our learning for our living. Watch this. Your engagement with one another helps us to study the life of Christ. It's sitting in his word. But then when I get up from being with him in his word, then I see how I can live that out. We have to be. Or this world is going to continue. This life is going to continue to be a drag. We get to take the opportunity and dare I say the adventure of learning every day with Christ. It's through the life of Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we live. So if Christ be our teacher and Holy Spirit be our coach, every day should be something great. It might be a great fall, but you get to get up. Coach ain't going to let you stay there. Come on, get on back up. So what did you need to do? Y'all, have you ever heard Holy Spirit? Have you ever seen life kind of talk to you in that way? Like, okay, now what? So you tried it your way? How, how'd it happen? How'd it work out for you? Okay, can we try it this way? I know you heard it. It was real simple when you heard it, but just try it. Y'all ever heard life talk to y'all like that? Holy Spirit ever come and be like, you good? Dust that off. Get up. But you sitting in your sin sick self, just thinking that it ain't, gonna, ain't nothing ever going to go right for me. This is the end. I ain't going to try no more. All men are dogs. I just ain't nobody good. Sin sick. You ready for death in the end. You're calling the end to something that God has already finished. Like we get to go on. The song they were singing, he said forever and ever and ever. Yet we limit who we are to this little existence. If God loves me forever, why do I just focus on the now? So why do I stop life here? Because you left. Why do I stop life here? Because I messed up. If he loves me forever, I have forever to live. I have forever to learn. Forever his love. So then forever his grace. 
then forever his teaching. Forever. What's the point of a new nature? What's the point of divine nature? Because we've been wrapped in this human nature. It's an example I use a lot about um, heaven and us reaching for eternity. And I ask my kids, you know, how would they feel? What's going on? What's your thoughts? I was like, how, how are we know how we're supposed to be? Like, what is it going to be like? Anybody else have questions about the hereafter? I'm not here to say I have all your answers. But just picture this with me. You and your family, your loved ones, you know your folk, right? You know mom, you know dad. And then all of a sudden they say, guess what? You're going to go live with uncle. You know uncle. Uncle got the ranch. He got the horses. You've been told about uncle's house. They always cook breakfast, lunch, dinner in between their snacks. You want to go to uncle's house. You've heard about uncle's house. Right? You want to go there. You want to be there, auntie and them. You heard about this distant relative. But then when it's time to go, because you've never lived with them, you've never shared with them, then you start questioning. Like, what's going to happen if I act up? What's going to happen when it's time to go to bed? Do they know that I need a light light still? What's going to happen when I... Tell them I don't eat this, but I eat that. Like, what's going to happen? How are they going to respond to me? And then what are they going to make me do? I know what mom and dad has me do. I know the chores that I have here, but what is that like? Then you start questioning. Then you're like, okay, well, that's cool. That's nice. You know, so when I get older, I'll be ready to go there. And they say, no, you got to leave now. Go now. And then all of a sudden, this great distant relative that you've been like, oh, they got great stuff. Ooh, they like, ooh, they lived. I love it. Oh, yes. Then you're like, mm, I don't know. Because I don't know how it's going to be. Some of us clamor for death to go to heaven with a God that we know nothing about. And so the importance of living in this divine nature is to begin to knit your heart, remind you of who you are so that when it's time for you to be with God fully, we say we're going to dance in your presence, but will you really? If your mind is still stuck on the sinful nature that you have, will you really dance in his presence? Will you really be free or will you draw back because you're really in front of an awesome and awful, holy and righteous God? Will it be so cavalier? Will it be so casual? How will we know? You have the opportunity here to make every day an adventure in knowing who your God is. What this nature will be. He said, we judge with the angels. How are you going to know what to say? We elevate the people that stand up here, but all of us are his sons and his daughters. You matter in his kingdom. Living into the divine nature starts when we say, I want to follow after you. I want to know more about you. It will challenge the very way that you live. The divine nature will interrupt the now nature. And you have to make a decision whether you will begin to lean into that interruption. Because that may change your direction from where you thought you were going in life. The divine nature says that as I learn and I see that, you know what, me feeling this way, it ain't right. You gonna lean into it? We have the blessing of having the word of God spoken over us, washed over us. But I'm concerned that we don't sit with it long enough. And so my, my Easter speech was to encourage the embodiment of who we are. 
my brother's discussed the different compartments. Pastor DeMarcus lifted up. We got to know what standard is. Peter just gave us a good one. He said, add to your faith. You believe in God. Now put some moral excellence, some virtue behind it. Do right. Then when you start doing right, get some knowledge. Learn why you're doing it. When you get the knowledge, it helps to bring about that self-control, that peace that you think you're, you're lacking because you keep doing other things. When you get faith coupled with doing right and you put that knowledge on what you're doing right, it helps to tame that thing to the degree where you can crucify it. See, we, we don't tame it so it can be a pet, so we can keep it. Self-control gets you to the place where you can tame it Grip it. Because he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You have to crucify self-control. You get control it. You, you get a grasp on it. Good enough. So then that next time that learning and living comes around, you're ready to hack it off. You get mad at yourself in the midst of the process. You gain in strength to grab that thing. The next time it come around, I get to kill it. I get to crucify it. Keep learning and living, people. But then when we get self-control, it brings us back in to steadfastness, consistency. See, we stop when we fall off. We're like, man. And then we, we go all the way back to square one and have to start all over again. But when you get self-control going, Watch this, you're not perfect, you're just getting a handle on some things. Then it helps me to remain consistent. See, it's like when you go to the gym and you start seeing results. That steadfastness is like those results. Like, okay, a little inch, all right. You know, pounds don't really mean everything. If I'm losing inches, I'm all right. That steadfastness gives you that push. The self-control gives you the push to remain consistent. That steadfastness then coupled with the reverence of who God is. So I'm like, Lord, I want to be pleasing to you. But when we don't have these things, see the, the mundane things, doing right, doing good, small things, we, we pass by it. Clock me in, y'all. You know I'm coming late, but clock me in. Uh, virtue, right? Moral excellence. You got to stop those things. Couple that with your faith. And then we can keep progressing on. Our steadfastness will lead us into godliness which then turns into brotherly kindness because when I'm gazing up at God I can't help but see you in a different light anybody look up at the sun and then you turn around and you look at people and it's hard to really see them but you know they're there you see the sun when you set your gaze on the father when you set your gaze on his glory, when you set your gaze on hope of life and godliness, you have no other choice but to see it in everybody else around you, to encourage it in everybody else around you. It ain't a come for me. I see godliness in you. Come on up. Let's go. Let's do it together. Godliness, reverence of God with us, watching us, beholding what we do. With that godliness, we go into brotherly affection. We see our brothers and our sisters differently. Our love for them changes. It's not about being right. It's about being reconciled. It's not about being my, me, myself, and I. It's about being the body of Christ. Our love language is different then. Because it's about the wholeness that we see when we gaze at the Father. Brotherly kindness comes in there. And when I start learning how to love my sister and my brother... This love speaks of the agape love, where there is no offense that can stand in the presence of love. Agape. You say life is boring. What's the standard of living? Learning, living, learning, living. What's my standard? Add to your faith, your belief in God, right living. Do what's right. Virtue, moral excellence. You always have something to do. Life from this picture is an adventure. Not to be mistaken. 
for death and the harboring of sin, but life and righteousness in God. You may feel less than, but when I remember that everything that Christ did on the cross and through his resurrection was for my continuous good, my continuous learning, I don't have to stop here. I don't have to stop at the failure. I don't have to stop at the death. I get to continue living in the divine nature, learning who I am in God. The standard of living is to live divinely. As we learn of Christ and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will live. Y'all, I think I took up all, all of my time. But there was a practice that I wanted, and I think the doorkeepers have the papers. And we gon' we going y'all got it? We gon' we gonna give a coaching through this. Learning and living. You have in your hands something you can begin to practice if you don't already know what it is. You can practice with your family. The early church fathers and mothers did this communally to help build the church's connection with God. This is not us reaching for some uh, untapped revelation more than it is being reverent in the presence of God. And at each stage, this is an exercise, this is a practice to where we allow the word of God to wash over us. Where we allow the word of God to find the ears of our hearts. So that it goes beyond what we know and what we hear. And it penetrates our hearts to the degree that our souls are stirred. And we begin to embody what we hear. It's called Lectio Divinia. And it's the divine reading of scripture. Where you read a passage of scripture very slowly. And allow the words to search you out. And I don't want to go over my time. I want to be um, conscious and aware of everybody's time here. At the start of this practice, you calm and you silence yourself. It's, it's a great practice to have for Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, or even Monday. So that you sit with the word that you just received. Because a lot of times we end up talking about other different things and that's all right, seeing about one another and that's good too. We go, we eat, you know, somebody, we take our Sunday naps, right? But in order for us to really begin to know and to know it in our souls and begin to have the courage to live it out, we have to let it wash us. We have to allow it to penetrate us. This is an ancient practice that is being revised and not to be confused with any other acts of meditation to reach some point of enlightenment more than it is for you to begin to learn how to hear and just be with God. We're going to live divinely as we learn from the divine. I love you, family.